Getco News special coverage of PDAC 2024 is brought to you by Gold Mining, Uranium Energy Corp, and Uranium Royalty Corp. Hey everyone, I'm Jeremy Safran. Welcome back to Kitco News' coverage of PDAC 2024 in the beautiful city of Toronto, where it's a little bit muggy and a little warm, weirdly enough. Yeah. Uh, our next guest today joining us is Brian Lundin, no stranger, of course, to the Kitco audience, also editor at the Gold Newsletter. And you're also the CEO of the New Orleans Conference, the Investment yeah. Conference, and it's 50 years this year. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It is the longest running investment conference in the world. And we have a great legacy that we try to burnish every year. Uh, so we have a lot uh, a lot on our plates this year. Yeah. A lot of expectations to make it a fantastic event for the 50th anniversary. And we're well on our way on do for doing that. Some special events, special speakers. Fun. But, you know, it's got a great reputation, and this year it's going to be really, really special. Yeah, I'm excited. I mean, I'm sure Kiko News will be there. I'm excited to see yeah. you there. This brings us to 2023. I mean, you, you wrapped up that conference. We've seen an interesting year in gold prices. Obviously, we yeah. had spot, uh, spot gold prices hit a record high in December. Central banks buying up gold. So I think we just broke through a $2,100 resistance level as here we speak, as yeah. we speak. Right. Uh, I'm curious, what's the forecast? Where are we at? Where do you see this going? Well, we are at a critical level. I know uh, people listen to me <laughs> know that I always say that, but it is. Lately, it has been. Uh, every level is kind of critical. You know, if you look at a uh, chart of the gold price over the past few years, and if you look at it from the eyes of a generalist investor, it's not really within the industry like we are watching it every day. Right. And they see that price chart of gold, and they see four, even five price peaks, in, generally speaking, between 2050 and 2080. And what they're seeing is a failure to break out. Mm. And they're saying that's not going anywhere. And when it does break out, that's when I'll start paying attention. So if you look at that chart, not from a purely technical uh, aspect, but just looking at it broadly, and you want to see a price break out to over 2100, maybe 2150 to show those generalists that this is indeed a real breakout and we're going higher. And I think that's what we need to start attracting just a little bit of that hot money that's in NVIDIA, yeah. you know, and the Magnificent Seven and the like. And we don't need to see a stampede of that money into gold and, and precious metals and mining stocks. We just need a thimbleful. Right. Just need to dip a ladle into that huge uh, ocean of liquidity that's in all these hot stocks, yeah. which are in bubbles that could go on a while. But still, smart money is going to start shifting allocations into gold and the market. The whole sector is so much smaller than all of these much larger markets. It's not going to take much of a shift in allocations to make a really big difference. So are we just waiting then for a corrective state, say the S&P? I mean, we see U.S. retail audience yeah. and investors always putting their money in there. I mean, 30 percent, 30 percent, right? If they can get it in one of those big cap stocks. Yeah. Uh, was there a disconnect? Are they just not understanding the opportunity of evaluations of, of oil producers and equities on the stock side? Uh, excuse me, gold yeah, on the right. miner side mm -hmm. and, you know, the actual gold price today. What's the yeah. disconnect? The markets don't care what the price of any asset is. They care where it's going. Right. So until, again, we show that kind of upward momentum, they're not going to shift. Now, unlike a lot of my friends and other analysts in the industry, I don't share the opinion that we have to have a significant correction in the stock market mm -hmm. to get gold moving. The, the, the thing people have to realize is that we're at the end of a four decade plus trend of not just easy money, but ever easier money. Right. And what this has done is made all of the uh, risk assets addicted to the idea that the Fed is always going to come back with some kind of, they're going to backstop the markets. They can't have the markets go down, so therefore they'll eventually go up and interest rate policy is the big driver there. Uh, so that drives everything. What used to be uh, contracyclical or inversely correlated assets you know, the classic 60-40 portfolio bond stocks. Now everything has started to become positively correlated. And it's all dependent on its flow of liquidity from central banks. Right. So long way of saying, once the Fed starts to pivot, it's going to light a fire under the global stock markets because all the central banks are going to follow suit. So stocks, bonds, commodities, precious metals, gold, everything's going to rise together. And uh, so I don't think we need that correction in stocks. Hmm. Now, with that said, if we get a correction in stocks, there's two ways it can happen. Gradually, so you see assets shift 
probably more into commodities right. because it's kind of the time for that. Or you have a very dramatic correction in the stock market. That kind of a thing creates a liquidity vacuum. We saw that in 2008. That means everything gets hurt. That means stocks, uh, all of these mining equities, everything will get sold off along with the, uh, the broader stock market and bonds. If that happens, you will see gold though rebound very quickly. Right. And uh, you'll see that because the prescription, the policy prescription from the Fed will always be the same. They're going to immediately come in with this day, tsunami of liquidity, uh, rescue efforts uh, across the board like they did in 2008, and they did to an even greater degree post-COVID. Yeah, well, let's talk about that, because obviously with all that cash being injected into the economy, we're seeing the effects of it now. We have a huge debt crisis in the yeah. U.S. Uh, there's so many things happening that in an election year that we haven't even started to decipher. So what's your forecast for this year? Where do you see uh, that market going in terms of you know, maybe Trump being in, maybe a Biden. Yeah. Is there any positives for our sentiment inside of commodities? I think it's, frankly, I think it's all positive. Uh, and I think we need to hear that, by the way, because there's still a lot of dour faces right. at this conference, even though gold has been doing so well. Yeah, but it's all positive, I think. And I think those macro factors overwhelm all of the political ones. I don't think it makes really much difference whether Biden or Trump gets in in the U.S., Trump's more of an easy rate guy. He may fire Powell and bring somebody more accommodating in. My point is that the Fed and other central banks are going to have to be accommodating regardless. Because yeah. the other thing that happens when you have 40, 40 years plus, four decades of ever easier money, where at interest rates, you see the bottom of the cycles, it's a stair step down to zero. When you have that over decades, that also encourages the accumulation of debts. Hmm because interest rates are always going lower and that's uh, embedded in the, uh, the, the public and investing consciousness. Debts as a result right now are so high that they can't survive, can't endure an interest rate environment right. anywhere near where we already are. You know, the cost of servicing the federal debt has just soared above the, the level that I've long predicted of a trillion dollars a year. And if you're talking about a deficit that's one and a half to two trillion dollars every year, and then you add another trillion on top of that, huh. just in interest, and people ask where are they going to get the money? Well, they're going to borrow more to pay the interest yeah. on the debt that's rising already. So it is a debt spiral in the U.S., and you can't, they just can't afford to have interest rates anywhere near this level. Bottom line is the Fed is going to be forced to pivot this year, and that's going to lift all of the markets and it's going to really lift gold, silver, precious metals, commodities, and mining stocks, I think, to the, the, the greater benefit of almost any other sector. Interesting. And do you think that they're going to do this pivot, as you mentioned, come a little bit more easing uh, in November? Or what's your timeline on that? I mean, the market's yeah. priced in so many price cuts. And with that dovish tone initially, we've stepped back. Yeah. But has anything surprised you there? Yeah, I thought it was going to come more more quickly. I'm, I'm surprised at the resilience of the U.S. economy, yeah. which has pushed back those estimates. But, you know, if we look back way back to last year for a prime example, we can see that uh, over the summer of last year, they started, the market started to reach forward and price in a pause. Mm. And, uh, and what they thought was going to happen very quickly, it did, didn't happen for about four or five months later, but it happened. Uh, December, we got an all-time high in gold because of some of the things we just talked about, the rising cost of servicing the debt, the, the rising deficit, and uh, some talk, some rhetoric from the Fed that they were going to look at, uh, at their first rate cuts. So the market started to really aggressively price that in. Then came January, and the rhetoric shifted, and what was uh, odds-on favored for a rate cut in March got pushed back to maybe May, right. and now the odds on favorite is June, almost assuredly by July. I think June or July, you'll probably see that rate cut. Any further back in the calendar, it's gonna look a bit too political with the elections coming in November. Yep. Uh, so I, I think we're still looking around the summer, but again, it's just a case of the pivot has pushed back four or five months. It's still going to happen. And all, the only thing the markets have been arguing over is the timing yeah. and how many cuts. The big issue is that they are going to cut, and that's going to create tailwinds 
where before there were very strong headwinds. So where do you think that there's, you know, some weakness? We talked about debt levels inside of the real estate market, for instance, yeah. commercial. I mean, it's unsustainable at these high interest rates. So obviously they need to start yeah. acting on it soon. Are they at the brink? Like, is this a more of a disaster than we think it is? Uh, they, it depends on how you define the brink. The brink is, I think, some point this year. Okay. Uh, this year, there's uh, a little under $1 trillion worth of commercial real estate that's going to be repriced, repriced at current rates. Mm. So you're talking that instead of two and a half, three and a half percent, they're going to be paying seven and a half, eight and a half, even nine percent, perhaps more because when those rates, when the, that debt comes to be uh, renewed, the, the banks are going to look at not just raising the rate, they're going to look at the underlying collateral. Right. And we can see what's been happening to that in commercial real estate. So that's a potential crisis in itself. Hmm. That's beyond the, the uh, in addition to the, the federal debt itself and the cost of servicing that. If you look at corporate debt resets in general, I mean, grossly across all developed countries, just the additional costs, debt servicing costs that are going to be borne at anywhere these interest rates is equal to the combined economies of Japan and Germany. Hmm. Again, getting back to the point that the global economy was built on a foundation of ever easier money and even zeroed interest rates, you know, negative yielding sovereign debt even. Uh, so they it just can't handle rates this high. Debts are too large and the leverage to interest rates is too great that the bottom line cost of servicing debt at anything close to normal interest rates is, uh, is you know, unmanageable. There, is there going to be consolidation inside of this market, in, particularly in the mining sector? Mm -hmm. When we start looking at the cost of capital, it's been so hard for juniors to yeah. go out and raise money. And a lot of them are really struggling right now. Is there going to be a reset if these commodity prices continue to, you know, on the incline? Or are we at the bottom? I, again, I'm, I'm uh, pretty optimistic on it. I, yeah. think we're, I think we're at the bottom. Uh, you know, I think we, what we will get and what has been absent is Western investor Western speculator investment in the sector. You can look at that from a number of different metrics. You can look at uh, the holdings in GLD, you mm -hmm. know, the Spider Gold ETF. They've been falling off a cliff. Even as gold was reaching for all time highs in December, the started of decline that's just been really precipitous. If you look at open interest on the COMEX, uh, it's collapsed. And, and yet, if you go over a few years when that open interest has gotten this low, Four out of five times, it has immediately presaged a very strong rally in gold. Uh, the only time it didn't, that rally was postponed by about three or four months. So we're in that window, and we may even be seeing it right now. Right. It's a weird market right now. Uh, it has been for the last couple of months because we've had underlying buying that supported the gold price over two thousand right. dollars very strongly. Net buying has come from central banks, which is kind of surprising and but encouraging. The other place it's come from, weirdly, has been uh, domestic demand in China, mm -hmm. Chinese investors. Typically, they buy on price declines. They're bargain, hunt, bargain hunter uh, buyers, but they're buying now of gold at all time high levels. The numbers for the Shanghai Gold Exchange withdrawals in January were the second highest ever. And you can see that it is absolutely soared. That's showing, uh, that's evidence of why gold has stayed over 2000. So the bigger point is, if we get Western investors coming into the sector, if we show them the kind of rally that shows, that proves an uptrend, which I think we may be doing now, for the really, perhaps the first time ever, we're going to have Western buying and Eastern buying and central bank buying all at the same time. I don't know that you can get the, the Sharpies and the Shorts trying to stand in front of that, right, right. Uh, or at least not to any great avail. So if this, there's a chance that this rally, because there's so much liquidity in the world and there's such a powerful case for the metals with the Fed coming up with Billy, that this one could be particularly strong. Hmm. Interesting. For the retail audience, in terms of investors, we were talking a little bit about the North American retail investor maybe not looking at gold and silver stocks or minor yeah. stocks as much. Maybe they're looking towards Bitcoin, things like that. We have a younger generation that are, yeah. you know, huge inflows into these yeah. Bitcoin spot ETFs. 
One could counter the argument that if they're understanding what hedging is against, maybe they come in and dabble in this gold market as well. Yeah, the, the philosophical argument for gold is really the same for Bitcoin. Right. And, uh, you know, they, they always compare Bitcoin to is the new gold. And, you know, even the Bitcoin coin symbol was a golden Bitcoin yeah, yeah, yeah. and all of that. I think they can get that argument. And I've been very encouraged over recent years in my conference, and particularly how our audience has gotten younger and younger, mm -hmm. and they're starting to appreciate that philosophical story and get more and more involved. There are, though, I think some real impediments. Uh, you know, when I started in this industry the better part of four decades ago, it was very easy for me to buy in the Canadian markets. Right. You wouldn't think that way, but, but it was. You had the right broker that could buy it and everything else. Uh, progressively over the years, it's gotten harder and harder for that to happen. And there, only, there aren't that many brokers right now that are really able to service uh, U.S. clients in Canadian markets that are able to clear the paper for private places. Take the legends off. And take the legends out. off, do all that. And, and even some of the big ones are starting to say, we're not going to... Uh, uh, we're not going to free up any paper for any stock under 50 cents. We're not going to do that. And and it's starting to get away from that market. A lot of it for liability reasons. Uh, so something really needs to be done there. Yeah. Um, if, if we're going to have a kind of a market that really benefits from Western investor flows, not just the youth, but across the demographic board, they need to make it easier for them to invest in anything besides the Newmonts, the Barracks, and the like. Right. They need to be able to invest in that sector because that is something, as we know, can really capture the imagination yeah. of an investing audience. The whole thrill of discovery, the excitement of a, of a big drill hole, all of that. Of course. The stuff that's, that's hooked us over the years. Uh, there's a big market out there that would appreciate that kind of uh, investment. We've seen... You know, the same thing in all these other sectors uh, that the, uh, the Reddit crowd mm -hmm. and all of that get involved in. But it just has to be easier. There has to be a mechanism in place. So, you know, I don't know what's happening in that respect, what can happen. Right. And I mean, the Canadian market, too. I mean, we got naked shorts. There's a lot of different issues yeah, that we a, have. A here. lot of issues. And then we have volume in the ASX. It's easier for American to go and buy into the Australian yeah. market. So yeah. uh, what can we do about this? Well, yeah, you need to make it uh, easier. You need to get, for instance, uh, uh, TSXV and the Toronto Exchange, you know, get them onto Robinhood and the right. like, and those trading platforms yeah. where, where uh, the younger crowd and really any retail investor can invest at least in the market without getting killed on the spreads and the like. Uh, you know, the OTC is, is tough because you can get killed on the spreads. Uh, but it's also largely unregulated. Yeah. And uh, I, I tell people who are new to the area, that to, to the sector, that if there's a mining stock that's listed in the U.S. from the OTC, but not in Canada, uh, don't go there because they're doing that for a reason. They're yeah. trying to avoid Canadian regulation, which is the best in the world. Because the Canadian exchanges have seen every sort of mining scam that could be perpetuated right. over many years, and they regulated against that. So it is uh, a secure area, a relatively safe area for investors to, to speculate in, assuming they can take a, the inherent speculative risk. Um, but it's not like that in the U.S., at least on that smaller scale, the, the junior scale of the mining industry. Yeah, it's fascinating. And I mean, there's so many regulatory issues there, too. Uh, let's talk a little bit about silver. What are your yeah. projections here? I mean, we're getting into a little bit of a rise. It's yeah. slow. Yeah. Some are talking 30. When we get really creative, there's some hoping yeah. for 50. Uh, what can we expect to see in that gold ratio to yeah. gold? I think it's going to close up. And, and uh, the fundamental basis for my analysis is that it always has before. Yeah. Uh, every time we've had a sustained gold bull market, which means one that's based on monetary issues, uh, like uh, central bank monetary policy, like the Fed pivoting. That's what we're getting into right now. Every time we've had a similar a bull market based on those factors, silver has outperformed gold. So I fully expect it to do so again, uh, you know, and, and, and significantly so, mm -hmm. because it's always happened. So you can get leverage to gold with silver, and you can get leverage to silver through silver miners and junior silver miners. So I think that's probably going to be, once again, the most explosive area once we have a, convince, uh, a convincing uptrend, one that convinces 
broader mark money to, to come into the market. So once we deal with the macro issues, we deal with the interest rates, we get the election. If this commodity cycle comes, is it going to be longer than it has been in the past? Do you see this one standing for longer? I do, and I hope so. We don't want a, uh, you know, blow off all the steam very yeah. quickly. Yeah. We want something like the 2000s, where we had seven, eight, even 11 years, depending on how you, you slice it, of a sustained bull market, which really builds fortunes in uh, the kinds of companies that are at this conference, where, where yeah, you know, you have a lot of companies, more companies that go up four or five, even 10 times, mm -hmm. but just as importantly, you have a market where even the losers, instead of losing 50 to 80%, yeah. they double in price. So if you don't lose money and your base investments are rising and you get a few of those really big hits over years and years and they, they, they keep going over and over again, you can really build a lot of wealth. I hope it takes a, an awful long time. If you look at it from a price level, I think there's a very good chance it's going to go a lot higher than people believe. Right. You know, right now, as we speak, we're in uncharted territory. So how do you project where gold can go? One way is you look at historic bull markets in gold, and there have only really been three, right. that, according to my count. You have 1970 to 1974, uh, the gold price went up about five and a half times. You go 1976 to 1980, it went up, I believe, about eight times. And if you go from 2000 to 2011, about seven times. Uh, the low in this cycle was $1,040. Yeah. So if you say it's going to go up at the end of this cycle, uh, somewhere between six and eight times in value, those are the kinds of numbers that you're looking at in the cycle. And I think that kind of a move is gonna take five to 10 years. Right. So I, I think we're entering uh, a truly a secular bull market because of these monetary factors. Debt's so large that we, we have to have negative real interest rates. Yeah, and you talk to some of these junior issuers that, like you said, have a little bit of a sad face. Momentum's yeah. coming. It's an optimistic year for the commodity cycle. I, I think it is. You know, attendance looks like it's been pretty good at this event, uh, but still people, you know, they've been, uh, they've been disappointed over and over again. Right. And yeah. they're kind of waiting for the market to hit them upside the head again with a, with a uh, piece of lumber when they just when they get their expectations high. So they're, they're still the cynical and cautious. Right. Um, what we have to convince again are those generalist investors to take a look at the sector. And I think that's gonna happen this yes. year. Yeah. All about education, especially with those younger ones. Brian yeah. Lentine, uh, I'll see you in New Orleans. Thank you, Great. sir. Thank you. Appreciate you coming on. And thank you for tuning in to Kitco News. Obviously, we'll have more coverage here at PDAC 2024. I'm Jeremy Safford. Don't forget to go to kitco.com and subscribe to our channel. We'll see you next time. Kitco News special coverage of PDAC 2024 is brought to you by Gold Mining, Uranium Energy Corp, and Uranium Royalty Corp.